I'm very excited today to announce our weekly seminar speaker, Mr. Bob Petrozelka uh, from Eastern Iowa. Uh, Bob is a field forester, as you'll find out. I'm very excited to have a field forester here. They always have very good stories. Uh, Bob's a native of Cedar Rapids. He received his BS in Forest Resource Management from ISU in 1979. After graduation, he worked for Huddig Sash and Door Company in Casper, Casper, Wyoming. Moved back to Iowa in 1984, where he worked for the Worth and Lee County Conservation Districts. Uh, conservation Boards, sorry. Uh, and Blackboard Nursery up in Mason City. In 1989, he became a staff forester for Geode RCND out of Burlington, Iowa. And since January 1, 2000, Bob has owned and operated Geode Forestry. So, um, Bob is open to asking questions during the presentation, so fire away. Um, so with Bob. All right, thanks. Thanks very much, Billy. Uh, when I uh, sent an email to my kids uh, telling them what I was going to be uh, giving the presentation on, and said, oh, when is it? And I said, oh, Friday at 3. Two of them uh, emailed back, I think independent of each other. Don't take it personally if nobody shows up. <laughs> Friday at 3, it, it, it's not you, it's the topic. And then another one wrote back, no, no it's the topic too. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we'll uh, try, to, uh, try to keep it interesting. So um, geode forestry, um, geode is a state rock of Iowa. A lot of people don't know that. We uh, find them in different creeks down there, especially after a heavy rain. You can go into the side hills where the uh, um, soil is wash, washed away and when you if you break them open uh, correctly, you get a, a real nice one like this. But uh, there are places you can go and always find them. So uh, we, we uh, the RCD I worked for was named after that. There's, um, you know, Geode State Park is down there, so I thought it was a natural to uh, keep the same name. Although people outside of the area don't don't often know what it is. So um, we will. Uh, We'll go through here. Th there's two main points I wanted to get across in this, and, and one is that oftentimes, speaking to people, they, um, they are surprised to learn that uh, I'm a forester and I'm in Iowa. They say, how, how do you have stuff to do? I say, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're swamped. Uh, a lot of people, just because ag or row crop agriculture is so big in the state, don't even consider that uh, trees might be a, another crop too that uh, that they often forget about. Guess I won't wreck anything back there. So um, you know, here's I just brought a couple samples of some of the uh, the the wood that is produced. The uh, the real hot one right now is walnut, and then white oak is is the other uh, hot uh, species that we're seeing right now, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. So. My co-worker Gretchen Klein was kind enough to uh, put a uh, <laughs> PowerPoint together. I think I can figure everything out here. Um, so just a little background um, on this, this forest cover in Iowa. We had about 7 uh, million acres at uh, the time of settlement, which uh, for some reason, you know, uh, white Europeans think that that was the most important time in the history of the state, you know, when we, when we got here. So. Generally, the rivers or the forest cover follows the rivers. So even, even if you don't have a map of the rivers of Iowa, if you have a map of the forest cover, you, you can find the rivers because it's, it's uh, they generally do that. Rougher ground that the uh, northeast Iowa, um, where the, the last glaciers did not come, and then where the bigger rivers uh, combine down here along the eastern border are where, where you'll have the bulk of the forest cover. A lot of times a uh, landowner calls up for the first time and says they want us to come take a look at their timber. And they say, now it's hilly. And our res I mean, we don't say it, but our mentally our response is, yeah, I know, because if it wasn't, it would be raising corn and soybeans for the last 100 years. But so all, all, all timber is pretty much hilly except the floodplains along the, the bigger rivers. Uh, what it looks like today, it's about uh, 3 million acres. So uh, uh, of course, lots of clearing. Um, mainly to, to form crop fields, but uh, also some of the cities, you know, larger metropolitan areas, urban expansion eats up a lot of forested acres as well. Um, that, so 7 million acres at time of settlement, 3 million acres now. 
this, the DNR's figures, it gets a little deceiving because when the, the uh, Forest Service does their annual surveys, sort of by definition, if forest cover has cattle in it, if it's currently being grazed when they look at it, even if it's a beautiful timber, they don't classify it as timber, they classify it as pasture. Uh, and uh, conversely, if they come back in the next 10 years and the cattle are off of the same spot, it, it again becomes timber. So uh, when, when that, bo those figures at that time were taken out that showed the increase, it, as much as we would like to think it would be due to our tree planting, it really was more the, the uh, because at that time the cow-calf industry had been, had uh, really gone um, out of the, the southern two tiers of counties. So it was just more by classification. Are you guys seeing these okay, or you need more lights off? Oh, good. They just seem kind of, see? It's one switch, so. It's, it's this. They just seem uh, kind of light to me. Other left. <laughs> You're other left. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, you, you can see see the uh, the pattern, and again, not not huge differences here. About five years ago, when the row crop commodities, corn and soybeans, really took off, when we were seeing you know eight dollar corn, seven eight dollar corn, and fourteen plus dollar soybeans. It, uh, it was very hard on the forest resource, especially in the southern two tiers of counties. I, um, I can't tell you how sickening it was just, just driving around seeing those huge uh, dozer piles of land that had been cleared um, and, and just going up in smoke. And, I, and I, I know everyone needs to make a living and I'm, I'm not, uh, I guess getting too, uh, want, don't want to be too harsh on anybody, but um, it's just a, a lot of clearing on very marginal land that um, right now with, you know, uh, $3 corn and uh, 8.25 beans, it's, it, I'm not sure how much difference it makes. Yes, sir? It, it was uh, the first time in my career that uh, there was an actual market price, a known market price for clearing trees and turning it into is that right? Yeah, I mean, usually it'd be like, oh yeah, I could do it for this much money, but there was a going rate <laughs> that a number of firms were charging straight up to go ahead and do that because it was that prevalent that, that it, it got set almost that there, yeah. there was enough supply and demand to create an actual price. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, it was, I mean, there was a waiting list for the dozers. Yes, there was. Uh, so it, it was, uh, it, it was kind of tough to watch. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, that you know that that six percent that that's a huge loss in a in a four year span. Uh, this, this I mean, you know, that, we we saw so much of that, and then as soon as it dried out, it'd be uh, be up in smoke. So um, Gretchen Klein is the my uh, co-worker. She's a graduate of Iowa State too. Used to be a, a district forester up in Northeast Iowa, and she was kind enough to put the slides together. And I, when she asked me what I wanted, I said, "Really, I, I think it'd be um, nice to take uh, whoever showed up <laughs> through through uh, a, a year. You know what we do? People say, what do you do?' And I said, "Well, it really depends on what what time of year you're you're talking about." So. Uh, starting in the, the spring, um, late March, we start getting our seedlings in. We have a big cooler at the shop in Swedesburg. Uh, I live in Mount Pleasant, by the way, so most of our work is in certainly the eastern part of the state. Heavier to the southeast, we get into Illinois some, Wisconsin once in a while, um, down into Missouri occasionally, although as I uh, reminded Billy, I, I, you know, no, no, no offense to his home state, but strange things happen when you go to Missouri sometimes. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, so then in the summer, so we get uh, tree planting and the spring takes us through uh, really till the first of June. In the summer, we're doing uh, tree planting maintenance, the, which is the mowing between the rows on row plantings of, of uh, the, and then uh, we start getting into the timber. Although if we have a downtime, I would say summer is it because it's, it's just, pretty miserable in July and August in the timber. It gets uh, just stifling hot. Uh, you just can't carry enough water. Um, 
and you know, but usually by like one o'clock, I'm I'm just shy because it's it, it's just too hot. So um, this time of year, uh, if I was uh, was not here, I would be out marking timber. I'm wearing my cruiser vest, uh, carry extra paint in the back, uh, have a uh, aerosol can of tree marking paint, and then a D tape over here, which I just carry to look cool. But I use it once in a while. Uh, no, honestly, I just, diameters I can, um, I, I, it, both Gretch and I are pretty much visual. We, we've done enough. We might, we might uh, check ourselves in the morning, you know, on a diameter of a tree, but we can, We've done enough that year. You get pretty good at estimating diameters because uh, that's you know how, how you get the tree volume along with the uh, height. Built more stick, um, and who I guess Jesse pointed out I need a new one, but it's because it's covered with paint on both ends. There's only a usable portion here, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I'll clean it off. It just but uh, I'm trying to get like I have two used up. I want to get one that each of my kids can have when I retire to hang over their fireplace or something. So this will be the third one. But uh, start off with that, uh, then a clipboard and the paint gun. So um, great way to spend a day. You, you have a tremendous amount of power. I've always thought marking timber because if, if you do it, the, the trees you decide to take out of that timber have, have repercussions, I want to say forever, but you know, 50, 100 years. So doing it wrong, you can really screw a place up. Um, hopefully doing it right, you can, you can keep the quality of the timber up and make it a sustainable resource uh, by leaving some den trees or killing and creating den trees. You can help non-game species. Uh, there's a lot more flying squirrels out there than you think. Uh, there's some, I mean, I'll, I'll, if I get lazy and don't walk around a tree before I mark it, if I just start marking on one side and then come around, there's a nice den, I'll go back and write no on it, so they leave that. So, um, but it's, there's a, that 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 is one gun that there's a lot of a uh, lot of lot of uh, or another <laughs> anyway it's a, important to do things right when you're marking the timber um winter we're doing uh, a lot of forest management so timber stand improvement and timber sales um and then all year we get called on for appraisals oftentimes people want to uh maybe purchase some land that has timber on it and they they want to see if there's potentially uh, a harvestable amount that they can use to help offset the cost of the property. Timber theft, we, we uh, act as expert witnesses in uh, timber theft, timber trespass, uh, damage, uh, which can get pretty interesting. And then uh, we do some threatened and endangered species surveys, mostly for Indiana bats, and then soon the northern long-eared bat as well. Um, tree diagnosis, people want to know whether to take a tree down or not. We, we sometimes get, not confused, but people think we're either uh, extension or DNR or some other entity get called, you know, to, to come out, which we're, we're glad to do it, just it can really eat up your time, because normally we don't charge, we just say well, if we're in the area, we'll stop by, and of course all your friends call, and, and you know, you don't charge for that, but uh, it's, I guess you like to be known, but you kind of have to keep them. Um, keep a uh, good uh, balance between uh, free work and, and making, it, making a living. So seedling planting, uh, I, I should have mentioned we had a, um, a fall tree planting also. And I also forgot that, uh, w was anybody in the class this morning, Billy? Okay, so I, f I forget if one of you asked, somebody asked about if, you're, if you just want to get started and, and get your name out there and you maybe don't want to work with uh, or can't find a, an existing consulting forester to take you on for a while, how to do it. I didn't give you a very good answer. I thought of a better one um, when I was talking to Zach. Go to, people won't know you uh, b because you haven't, you just graduate, okay? So go to the people that a landowner is gonna call. So like a DNR district forester, Iowa State University Extension Office, uh, the County Conservation Board, the USDA office, field office that has uh, FSA and NRCS located in it. Go to, go to those places, introduce yourself, uh, tell, them, tell them the kind of work you, you do, give them all your contact info, and just let them know you're, you're there and uh, are, are looking for work. So, because they're the ones that are gonna get the calls. Okay, so uh, spread that around to your classmates because I felt bad this morning. I wasn't at the top of my game. 
Uh, <laughs> so, um, Summer, we just, Gretchen just took these last week. It's a uh, planting we had uh, just like five miles west of the shop from this spring. I know, it looks like rows of weeds, but within that, the trees look great. It, it looked beautiful this spring. Uh, we planted it, I sprayed it, so we had four foot wide rows of bare soil uh, with the trees sticking up. Two things, if, if the rows are too clean, uh, this time of year you put too much herbicide on. Uh, and there's a, a, a real balance between having enough on and, and too much. Uh, you want it so that the first and second flush during the growing season, the seedlings uh, have all the sunlight they need, but then as you get later where they're, you know, there's uh, late summer, early fall, um, it's kind of good because it hides them from deer bras too. Timber stand improvement. Probably the, if I had to choose one thing I like best, it's, it's doing TSI. Um, I like in a good timber that's overcrowded, I like uh, walking out at the end of the day after running a chainsaw all day and, and you can look back and, and think that you did a lot of good for that timber. Uh, it gets kind of disappointing in a timber full of shingle oak and honey locust because you really can't do much good. Yeah, the, the real high quality timbers and the real low quality timbers are hard to do because you're the high quality timbers you have to kill nice quality trees. You know the trees you kill might be the b best trees in another timber but if you don't kill trees and open the uh, give the other trees more sunlight you're not doing much good. So uh, we're doing we're doing that this time of year. Our favorite herbicide is Pathway. Same thing as Tordon. It's a Dow AgroSciences product. Uh, you don't have to paint the whole stump, just the cambium area. Also in the fall, direct seeding, which is another um, method to plant trees. We're actually planting the nuts, uh, acorns, walnuts, uh, ash, cherry seed. It, it works good, um, but uh, uh, you, you can't get always get every species you want that year. So, for example, this year, down where we're at, um, there, there was plenty of walnut, there always is, but there, there's no white oak seed acorns and very little red oak. There's lots of hickory. Uh, it's, it's hard to get seed of every species every year. Uh, so it gets to be a little, little challenging. Uh, this is Gretchen's, the other forester. Um, Sandy Hedges, this is down uh, north of Burlington on one of his timbers. This is a white oak. Different species do better in parts of the state. We have, uh, I'm real proud of the white oak we have in southeast Iowa. It's, it's, it's best quality in the world. Our red oak is, is okay. It's not as, the further north and east you go, the red oak gets better. Northeast Iowa has better than we do. Uh, black cherry, the further north and east you go, Pennsylvania's is best. Um, but yeah, that's, that's you know, probably, it, it wasn't an open grown tree, it, it had a lot of form, so it's you know, approaching 200 years old. So, uh, it looks like I killed that tree, I don't know what I was doing. But, um, so here, here are Gretchen's marking the tree, putting the <laughs> paint on it. We scale each tree, just uh, of course, you know, her equipment's the same as I have, recording DBH, merchantable height, the nearest half log. And then we prepare a uh, bid notice. We just had five notices we sent out and op where we, we opened bids on two days ago on Wednesday. We sent it to uh, 24 sawmills and bonded timber buyers. Got 11 bids back uh, from you know Dubuque, Wisconsin, Illinois, and then the rest were from Iowa. Um, not everybody bid on every sale, but the uh, nicest sale was uh, was was white oak. It's I, 26 years of doing this. I've 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 never white oak and walnut have never been higher than they are now. They're they're both uh, can't can't get enough of them. There's uh, I think there's eight Chinese buyers in the state right now wanting to buy these two species. Going around to the mills and loggers, uh, just trying to find enough. Most of that's getting exported, especially the veneer and nicer quality saw logs. Uh, China's the biggest buyer. Japan takes a lot. South Korea, uh, Vietnam, India, some to Europe. Um, but yeah, it's it's. So, on your dead tree up there, Bob, 
I mean, is that still marketable? Yeah, I would still market. I, I think what I was doing is seeing how bad it was. Our rule is that uh, if the bark is still, most of the bark is still tight, <coughs> we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and scale it and include it in our tree count. If, if it's uh, too far, uh, we'll, we'll ha call it a coal tree and put an X on it, we'll still include it in the tree count, but not take a volume measurement on it. And uh, then they'll, they just have to decide, we keep track of them, but they have to decide what they want to put on it. So there's a lot of trees that are still usable after they've been dead a while, like not hickory, that, that lasts six months, but certainly oaks, walnut, elm. And uh, it, it'll just like, if that was a veneer tree when it was alive, it's probably at this point knocked down to a, a lumber log. Um, or if it was lumber, it might get knocked down to pallet. So it just keeps deteriorating as, or going down in grade as, as the tree uh, decomposes. Um, then after the bids are out, loggers come in. This is Mike Stolfel from Dubuque on the left. Their dad, he and Rob logged together. Uh, their dad, Stanley, was a logger up in, up in the Dubuque area. Um, but they, they, were, they were very good loggers. Um, here they, uh, they put a cottonwood log. This is the main skid trail coming from the timber going out to the landing in the field. So they put a, a cottonwood log next to that walnut so they wouldn't bump the walnut uh, with either the skidder or, or the, the log they were skidding out. They're there with their skidder. Typically they'll fell the tree, cut the branches and the top off, leave those in the timber, skid, skid the tree out tree length uh, to the field and then uh, come by, mark it off where to bucket, cut it, cut it into lengths on logs. Loading the logs, they'll typically, you can haul uh, veneer and quality saw logs a long ways. You can't haul pallet very far because if, if you do that, you'll have more in uh, transportation than you'll get out of the log. So a lot of times independent loggers like, like Mike and Rob were, will uh, leave the pallet there and then they'll sell it to the closest pallet mill they can um, make a deal with. And this is in the uh, log yard. This is at Hamas Brothers Sawmill in, in uh, Keokuk County, Ali. So just they sort them by species and oftentimes grade out in the log yard. Um, they're a big soft maple mill that they just as soon cut that all day rather than oak or walnut. So um, they just have good, good markets for that. Uh, okay, the, the bat habitat surveys, Gretchen pretty much does those anymore, but whenever government money is used in projects, they, they have to do uh, surveys for threatened and endangered species. And the, the one we deal with are, are the, like I said, the um, Indiana bat and the northern long-eared. And it, there's, there's different rules as far as uh, what qualifies as habitat. It's typically tr live trees like shagbark and shellbark hickory, sometimes silver maple, uh, or dead trees that have platy bark on it with a uh, certain percentage on, I forget what that is now. Uh, certain diameter water, permanent water has to be within a half mile of the, of the site too. So um, I think threatened and endangered species are gonna become a bigger, um, not obstacle, but a, a bigger uh, concern for, for uh, a lot of the, right, a lot, lot of the forestry activities. Tree appraisals, um, not my favorite thing to do, but there's so much, um, litigation anymore that this was a case of two landowners south of um, Tipton. J you know, normally it's not about the trees, they're just mad at each other about something else, but, but <laughs> it, it ends up you know, being that. So like someone will put a price of $5,000 on a, 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 I think an ironwood, you know, it's inch and a half diameter. So <laughs> I mean, we, we if someone, someone calls and wants to do that, I say, look, <coughs> It's probably going to cost you more for our fee to, to do it than what I'm going to appraise it at. So why don't you try to get along with your neighbor and, and just get it settled instead of getting a hold of the two attorneys and, and us. So um, when we do it, I'm not bashful about charging. I'm pretty good. But, uh, but uh, it's, it's sometimes it's kind of fun. 
you know, it's he's kind of a challenge, uh, and you always like, yeah, yeah, I won't say anything. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> some of the threats to Iowa forests that we see. A big one is grazing. Livestock are, are absolutely terrible on timber. I always tell people if you put, if you put livestock into a, a forest, it starts out as grazed timber. Uh, after a while, or it starts out as timber, then it's grazed timber, then it's pasture, and then it's just open grassland because they'll, they'll, uh, they'll eventually kill the timber. Uh, there's you know, no seedlings coming in, the soil compaction is crazy, no water infiltration, uh, it just runs off, reduced organic matter. Um, and you can absolutely see it in the quality of the saw logs, even if their cattle have been removed for 20 or 30 or 40 years. Oftentimes we go out and you, you can tell immediately if it was had a history of grazing, which most timber does, it, at, at least in, in southern Iowa. Uh, it, it's got sort of a, a, a bell-shaped curve at the butt of the, of the tree. Um, most of the time those are bad and you have to trim off three or four or five feet of the butt end before you get into a sound, sound log. So uh, unfortunately that's gotten bad because with beef prices, if, if you've, um, like Jesse, and you eat steak every night, you know that you're gonna, um, it, with the price of that, the, the cow calf herds have, have really increased. Uh, another threat is, is or uh, yeah, threat is, is crops. The pressure to, to turn marginal timberland in, into crop ground is, is, was real high. And I'm surprised that, I guess, kind of, I'm surprised that more isn't going back in to, uh, to timber now that they cleared off. But I think the mentality is they put so much money into clearing it that their, their dozer bill was so high they can't afford to, you know, like put it in CRP or, um, so they have to keep growing crops on it, which of course just adds to the glut. And, uh, but it's, it's, uh, yeah, it, it was bad, so. Urban sprawl, same, this is a picture of the same area. And, um, you know, it's not thousands of acres like you get from, from expanded crop ground, but it definitely takes a toll. And, um, you know, especially on the east, a lot of the urban cities, you know, Cedar Rapids, De Quad Cities, Dubuque, Burlington, a lot of those areas around the river are in, in uh, heavily forested areas. Keokuk, Fort Madison, uh, bypasses come in. They, they put one around, uh, they're working on one now around Burlington. Th those things take up a lot of room and uh, a lot of it's timber down there. Insects and diseases. Uh, 26 years, well, okay, 20 years ago, hell, 15 years ago, I, I had never heard of emerald ash borer. Uh, we hadn't heard of uh, sudden white oak death. And now, we, we literally cannot keep up with timber harvest uh, as fast as the trees are dying. Uh, we, we had a group of sales south of New London, Iowa, in Henry County, that, that they're cutting them right now. I marked them a year ago, and since the logger called and said, hey, Bob, there's a lot more dead trees here that aren't marked. And I, I went down and sure enough, there's trees just died in that 12 month period. And I, I mean dead, not, not looking bad, but dead. Foresters all throughout at least Eastern Iowa, certainly Southeast Iowa, we're seeing that. There's a, um, I think there's a professor down at University of Missouri that they, they've recognized it's terrible in Missouri. No one right now knows what it is. I, we saw oak wilt for a long time, but it was always affecting the uh, black and, and red oaks. So the, the red oak group, not the white so much, but I mean, we're, we're seeing whole timbers dead uh, of, of white oak, uh, bur oak also. So it, it gets, uh, it, if you let it, it gets your, you can get pretty discouraged not knowing what to manage for. Uh, you know, one time we planned a lot of ash. We used to recognize ash as, an, as a crop tree for the future, because it, it's a nice, nice looking wood. But even before emerald ash borer, we were being very aggressive as far as marking ash for harvest, because it was dying from other stuff. So EAB really didn't have any effect on how we, our philosophy is towards uh, marking ash. We, we were already marking it very hard. Um, but th there, there's just, with, with global, global um, 
trade. There's just so much that comes in, and, there, and there's just, you know, Asian longhorn beetle, um, thousand cankers disease on walnut, which isn't here yet. But it, it's, you know, Tennessee. I mean, it's, it's, it's getting close. Uh, it, it makes it, like I said, kind of hard to manage for without knowing uh, what the next insect or disease is going to be. Some other threats, uh, reed canary grass on bottomland timbers makes, it, it, and it too is a uh, non-native invader, makes such a thick mat that it's impenetrable to any of the tree seeds. So you normally see that in the bottoms along the rivers. Amana has a, Larry Genevico, the forester up there, does, it does not know what to do. He cannot regenerate silver maple, cottonwood, or anything in the bottoms. He's just ending up with bottoms of reed canary grass. You can, uh, burning it, it, it loves, it'll come back more vigorous than ever. You can burn it, let it regrow, spray it with Roundup. Uh, it, it'll, be, it'll be right back. Th th there's just, no, no one knows what to do on that yet. Honeysuckle is one of the most obnoxious plants I know of because when you <laughs> walk in there, it's just at the, you know, it, it crowns, like right here is right where up here. <coughs> And, and that stuff is stout. You, you cannot walk through it. So you end up on your hands and knees crawling through here to the next tree you need to mark or, or kill. Uh, again, very hard to control. You can do some basal sprays um, with garlon, but it, it's to trying to control it. The, the, um, garlic mustard, huge problem in northeast Iowa. We do have it down in, in southeast Iowa as well, but not so much, um, I would say, a threat to the actual trees, but more to the, to the native um, uh, herbs and, and, and uh, other growth. You s when you see it come in, it, it takes over everything, real thick carpet. Um, you know, there's no practical way to control these things. There, there, there just isn't. And you can do everything good and pull every last garlic mustard, but if your neighbor across the fence doesn't do anything, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's a complete waste of time and money. So, uh, where did Gretchen say she took this? I think it was uh, looking west from her, from her house. So, uh, just a uh, view of the Iowa landscape. And it reminds me that, you know, crops and trees have to coexist. Um, they, they did, you know, a lot of Iowa, people think it was either woods or prairie, but really a, a lot of it was savanna. So, you had the, the two together. Uh, we can have both. We have to make smart decisions. Um, but uh, it's, it, it can be done. We just, there are challenges, um, but uh, th th they can be met. So um, that was all I had. Um, sure, open it up to questions. We got 10 minutes for questions, so fire away. Probably the uh, the former one you mentioned. I, I barely know what a tree is. Yeah, um, yeah but broad range. Th there aren't many that really. There are many that want to do the right thing, um, so, which is good. Um, yeah, very few know their species. Um, I find a lot that think, especially on a timber harvest, a lot that heard uh, you can. There's a you know ten thousand dollar walnut trees, and they're sure they have some. You know, I tell them there's a, a whole lot more $100 walnut trees than there are 10,000. So, um, but I, I would say most people r really don't know what to do. And it ranges, ownership ranges from people that just acquired a property to, uh, you know, third, fourth generation uh, landowners that, that feel they, you know, they've never done anything in the timber and they just think they, they want to see if they should be doing something. So whether it's a harvest or planting more trees or, but uh, yeah, I would say most people uh, r don't, uh, don't know species and really have even more so have, have very little idea of what needs to be done.
So, uh, in terms of, uh, like, I guess research at the university, mm -hmm. what would you like to see more of? Like, what would help you do your job better if you knew uh, people were doing good research on, I guess, X to, like, help, help you, I guess, assess better or um, be better prepared of kind of what's to come or... Mm -hmm. Oh boy, uh, you know, I, I would say, um, I mean, it, it, my first response is help us find answers to the uh, diseases and insects that are killing trees, but if you do, I'm not sure we can do anything, because, yeah. uh, you know, th there has to be a practical side from all the, for all the research. You're, you're a, this is a land-grant institution, and part of that is applying the science, <laughs> you know, not, not just learning what's going on. Uh, I, I don't know. It's more, the, the bigger problem, I think, is, is, is not in the timber, it's with the people. Our bigge biggest challenges are, are more uh, social. So, for example, the, the lack of continuity of, of, of land ownership. Uh, I told someone earlier today the example of a gentleman named Mel Raid <coughs> down in Van Buren County, <coughs> great guy did everything right for probably 60 years. Uh, I mean, he died when he was mid-80s. We did prescribed burns for him, planted trees, did timber stain improvement, uh, several harvests. He, he, Mel passed away, and uh, none of the family wanted the property, so they sold it. And uh, this, uh, this, this other guy. <coughs> <laughs> the new owner, Bob. The new, the new owner bought it. Uh, I'd like to say something, but I won't. <laughs> but uh, but uh, completely big shot. He was a big shot, okay, from Texas. Uh, no offense to anybody from the Lone Star State. But uh, he uh, he thought he knew what he was doing. Cut every tree or sold every tree like like 10 inches and up, and then just dropped every tree. He thought he was going to open up a big uh, hunting preserve. Completely, completely ruined the, t the property. So... You, you get, th yeah, but he's in a huge trouble with the DNR now for, for deer violations, so. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no idea who turned him in. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so it, it, it's those things. You, you know, forestry is, managing timber is so long term, and if you don't have control over it, it makes it very difficult. Uh, you know, because anymore, doing things right for 20 years is, is kind of the, the norm, it seems like. Um, you know, and then we, one of the harder things we do is, is when we get almost forced into doing the wrong thing. Um, I, I had uh, somebody asked me earlier about, uh, I think it was Zach actually, the directions you get from landowners. Okay, so just two sales ago, we had a fellow who, he, he had to have $40,000. Oh, it was ever, if I ever high grade. So yeah, I, I do which isn't the great thing to do, but this guy had to have $40,000, but he leased his land out for hunting, so he didn't want to, uh, he wanted to cut as few trees as possible. So I, you know, I was, uh, had to cut and sell the, the nicest trees to cut as few to still get him his 40,000. So you don't feel good about it, but uh, you know, if you don't do it, he'll, he'll do it right with, with a forester. So sometimes when people, force you to cut stuff hard, you kind of, you can like leave a tree you forgot, you know, in the back for seed or something, so. Oops, yeah. <laughs> so I have maybe a weird one. So most people in Iowa live in municipal areas. They live in town. So hmm. what if they have this tree that's nice and big, die in their yard, can they turn that into timber that they can sell? Or they just end up getting chipped and thrown on so many floors? Are you one of these people? My parents. Okay, well, <laughs> we get so many calls on that, especially after uh, there was an article that came out in the Cedar Rapids Gazette that uh, had Jeremy Kubitz, a logger from Dubuque, and then uh, my, myself in it, but the, fo the phone started ringing because it was talking about the value of walnut and white oak. It's, it's really difficult unless it's, it's walnut. Um, any other species, I'd say no, because they're, the loggers don't have the insurance for, uh, to, you know, there's always wires or a garage or, or a house or an automobile, something there that's going to get wrecked. Um, if 
it, it's like if you, if you would get the log cut down, drive it to the sawmill, they'd pay you something for it. But still, there's a really good chance it's going to have metal in it. Yeah, I know, you didn't put it in, or your parents didn't, but it, someone had a squirrel feeder or a clothesline or a thermometer or a sign or something in it. Uh, that's, that's buried, and so uh, they're real reluctant on that. Every once in a while, if it's a really nice walnut, uh, they'll, they might hire someone, a tree service, to come in and limb it up, drop it, and then, I mean, if it's a you know, tree worth four or $5,000, you might, you could spend $1,000 getting out of there if you're you know, paying the landowner $1,000 for it, so you're making a couple grand, but generally not. Is it a walnut? No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and I think they're having a lot of the, the white oak death going on in there because they lost a couple last mm -hmm. year. It's like, they can't even find anybody who wants to try to even take it out. No, and especially it's if it's dead, it's yeah. then you're already taking a chance because stuff doesn't always fall where you want it to. Yeah. Somebody else had one. We got time for one more. We got to shut down five minutes early, unfortunately. Yeah, I was just going to ask, I mean, it sounds like you're swamped. Yeah, anymore it's word of mouth, uh, referrals. I, I'm always curious, uh, so I ask people from time to time that when we get, get the initial phone call, uh, where they got our name, and almost all the time it's, uh, it's a referral from a, someone else we did some work for. But you know, we're still old school, like we still advertise in the, the phone book. Uh, part of that's because my brother works for Yellow Book, but <laughs> um, <laughs> and I do get a disc family discount. But uh, we advertise with, uh, what's the other big one? Uh, the, the, the other one too, so. Um, we're, you, know, and a lot, you know, a lot of uh, not young people still look in the phone book, the yellow pages. So y you get some from that. I mean, one job will we'll pay for the ad for, for the year. So that's the one. We have a website. Um, oh, I don't know, Forestry Field day Days. We, we, uh, we, you know, we're always very careful about not promoting ourselves at those because we're there for information, but people obviously see where we're from and might want to do that. But I, I would say most of it's referrals. Um, so you do, you know, you, you do a good job of, of what you're at, provide a quality product, be fair, um, do, do what you told the client you, you're going to do, get it done on time. Um, I don't care what business you're in, there's always someone, a competitor, who will do it cheaper. Uh, we've never uh, advertised ourselves as being cheapest. Uh, I don't want to be, but um, that that that's uh, just once you get established, it it the business will will start coming in. Thanks, Bob. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for attending. Really appreciate your time. Um, you're uh, free to join us for dinner. I, was, I don't know where to go. I'm going to suggest Wallabies. Is that good?